Okay, welcome back. So last time we saw how to do numerical differentiation of a function f um, on a discrete grid. So we essentially took our normal definition of a derivative from calculus, and instead of taking the limit as you know, delta t or delta x goes to 0, we use a finite delta t or delta x, and we saw how good this approximate der derivative was. So now we're going to look at how to do numerical integration of a function. So oftentimes we'll have some, uh, some function f of, let's say, of x, okay? And instead of taking the derivative of this function, maybe we want to find the area under the curve. So we want to approximate the integral of this function over x or over time. Um, so lots of different ways you could think about doing this. So um, let's say that I want to know how many seashells there are on a given beach. And I have measurements at different locations of how much seashells there are at x1 and uh, x2 and x3 and so on and so forth. So I have measurements of you know, how many seashells there are on the beach at all of these different locations, xn. And I would like to approximate what the integral of all the seashells over the entire seacoast or over the entire beach length would be. Okay, so that's one example. Um, if this was a function of time, maybe I have some kind of a disease that's spreading across a country, and the number of reported incidents of sickness in every month are what I'm measuring, and I want to integrate that up into some kind of a, you know, an approximation of the actual um, total number of sick people in that country over that period of time. Okay, so adding up or integrating a function makes a lot of sense. Uh, and it's very, very you know, similar to what we did with numerical integration. Okay? So here um, we have all of these spatial points, x1, x2, x3, all the way up to xn. And so now we're going to call these function points uh, f1, f2, f3, f4, uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on and so forth, up to fn. Okay, good. And remember from uh, calculus class how we normally set about doing this, this integral is what we would normally do is approximate the area under this curve by a bunch of rectangles. Okay, so we would chop this up into a bunch of delta x's just like we've already done. And then we would construct rectangles using each of our points and so on and so forth, and we would approximate the area under this curve by the sum of all of these rectangular areas. Okay, so I would literally just add up all of these rectangles, and it would be a pretty good approximation for the area under this curve. Okay, and as I make this delta x smaller and smaller, these rectangles get closer and closer together, and they do a better job of approximating uh, this integral. Okay, so I'm going to write down the formula that we use. We say that the integral, and we're going to integrate from some location a to some location b. That's what we're going to call these x values. On the left is a, and on the right is b. And so if we're going to integrate from a to b, our function f of x dx, okay? Now in, in the calculus way of doing this, we would take some limit as the number of rectangles goes to infinity or as the width of each of them goes to zero. So let's say that this equals the limit as the number of rectangles goes to infinity, as n goes to infinity. And what we're going to do is we're going to add up each of these um, areas of the rectangles. Okay, so what I have is um, right. So what I have is a sum from uh, k equals one to n minus one. So I'm going to start with uh, my first rectangle, and then my second, and so on and so forth, and there will be n minus 1 of these. Okay, so I'm going to get, go from k equals 1 to n minus 1. And I'm going to say that this is equal to this times f. 
evaluated at um, xk times delta x. Okay, so what I'm doing is I'm saying, okay, I want the first, um, I want the first rectangle that's going to be my function evaluated at x1 times delta x plus my function evaluated at x2 times delta x plus my function evaluated at x3 times delta x. So k equals 1, 2, 3 steps me through each of these rectangles. And they're each multiplied by this delta x. Okay, and if you want to be really careful about things, you can say, well, this delta x um, equals b minus a divided by n. Okay, so as n goes to infinity, this delta x, maybe I'll write that explicitly. This is b minus a divided by n. Okay, this is what we're normally used to seeing for the integral. This is um, the left rectangle rule because I'm starting from the left endpoints. And this is equivalent to saying the limit as delta x goes to zero of the same sum, k equals 1 to n minus 1, of f of xk times delta x. Okay, so this is an expression that we like. And just like in the numerical differentiation, we're going to approximate this integral by this expression with a finite delta x. We're not going to really take it to zero. We're going to take some finite but small delta x, and we're going to use this expression to approximate uh, the integral of our function. Okay, make sense? Good, and this is the uh, left rectangle. Because I'm using the left endpoint of the rectangle to approximate. I could also do something similar with the right rectangle. So let's say I have a similar or the same function, and I have the same data points. So now instead of approximating my rectangle height by using the left endpoint, now I'm going to use the right endpoint. And I'm going to approximate my integral using these areas, and so on and so forth. And notice that with my left rectangle, I'm under predicting by all of these little triangles. All of these unfilled triangles here are being under predicted. Right? My rectangles are not capturing this stuff. And all of these triangles where the slope of my function is negative are being over-predicted. So these are over-predicted. And these portions are under-predicted. Okay? And the right rectangle rule is going to do the exact opposite. It's going to over-predict these portions where my slope is positive, and it's going to underpredict these portions where my function slope is negative. Okay, so we're just looking graphically. Obviously, there's going to be some error associated with this, and again, we can quantify how much error, uh, how much error there is. So I told you that this was the left rectangle. So let's also write um, the right rectangle. So this could also be written as the limit as delta x goes to zero of sum, but instead of summing from k equals 1 to n minus 1, I'm going to sum from k equals 2 to n minus 1, right? Because this right point starts at x2, not at x1, okay, and so on and so forth. So now we're starting at this right rectangle rule, uh, f of xk delta x, and this is the right rectangle. And notice that the only thing that's different between these is where my index starts. Here it starts at 1 and it goes to n minus 1. Here it starts at 2 and it goes to n, to all the way to the right boundary condition. And so these are both uh, exactly equal to the integral. And they're going to be slightly different when I use finite delta x's for these. Okay, So these are the two integration schemes that we're going to try. All right, let's plot this up in MATLAB. Okay. 
Okay, good. So now we're going to try this, and we're going to try this for a particular function. Um, I usually like to do this for sine of x because we know what the integral of sine of x is, and we can you know exactly compute this. So let's assume that f of x equals sine of x. Okay, good. f of x is going to equal sine of x. Okay, so first things first, we clear everything in MATLAB, we close everything, and now we're going to define the left and the right boundary points A and B. A equals 0, B equals 10. We're going to define a vector of x in increments of delta x of 0.01. So x fine equals A in increments of delta x all the way up to B. And I'm going to define a fine vector with a small delta x. This is where we're going to use like uh, kind of approximate the exact integral. And then I might introduce a coarse delta x to see what happens when I make delta x big. Okay. Okay, good. <clears throat> and now we're going to create um, our function f of x is, yeah, maybe um, we'll call this axis the y-axis. So the fine y-axis is equal to sine of my fine grid x, and I'm going to plot xf by yf. Okay, so let's just see what that looks like. Okay, so this is my nice function defined on a really fine grid x. It's just a sine. Okay, and so now we're going to use a coarse grid, and we're going to say dx coarse equals 0.1, uh, and we're going to say x coarse equals a in increments of dx coarse all the way up to b. And we're going to say y course equals sine of xc. And we're going to do a stair plot, so stairs of x course, y course in red. I think I needed a parenthesis here. Okay. And lastly, I need to put a hold on here. <clears throat> okay, so this is kind of graphically representing what's going to happen when I use um, a coarse delta x of 0.1. You see that you're getting this kind of jaggedy, um, these jaggedy rectangles, and you're going to underpredict in some places, overpredict in other places, um, and it looks like it might actually cancel out pretty well. So that that'll be interesting to see. Okay, good. So now it's time to actually try some of these left rectangle and right rectangle rules. So I'm going to, the last thing I'm going to do is say n equals the length of x course. Okay, this is how many rectangles I have. It's a finite number. It's not infinite. And we're going to say our left rectangle rule. So area 1 is equal to 0. And we're going to say 4k equals 1 to n minus 1. This is my number of rectangles. We're going to say that my area equals area plus dx course times my function value at index k. Now you'll see that this is exactly the same expression as what we're doing here. Okay, so we're taking our area and we're adding to that area for every k we're adding dx times our function evaluated at x sub k for k equals 1 to n minus 1. Okay, I'm going to semicolon end. And um, I'm also going to plot the, I'm also going to look at the right rectangle rule. Area 2 equals 0, 4k equals 2 to n, so this is my number uh, rectangles. We're going to say area 2 equals area 2 plus dxc times yc of k. Same deal. And the only thing that's changed here, notice, is uh, the summation now goes from 2 to n instead of 1 to n minus 1. Okay, good. Um, 
sounds good. And then the last thing I'm also going to do is um, compute very accurate approximation using trapezoidal integration on fine grid data. Okay, so I'm going to tell you about what trapezoidal integration does in the next lecture, but for now I'm just going to show you the MATLAB command and we're going to use this as a reference. So area accurate equals trap z. This is the built-in MATLAB command to do this fancy trapezoidal integration I'm going to tell you about. And we want to do trap z of our fine grid xf with our fine data yf. Okay, so I'm going to run all of this. Uh, we get our plot. Something went wrong. Okay, what went wrong? Okay, um, okay, I didn't do the right length command. I typed length incorrectly, so let's try length like that. Well, let's try to run this again. Good. So I still get this plot. I don't get any errors. And now I'm going to type out area accurate. This is the accurate integral. I'm going to tell you about it in the next video segment. This is my trapezoidal integration, and this is kind of an accurate approximation to the area under that curve. And then we're going to look at how our left and right rectangle rules do. So area 1 was my left rectangle. Not too bad. And area 2 was my right rectangle. Okay, so both of these are actually pretty darn accurate, um, but you notice that area one is over predicting and area two is under predicting. Um, but you know, you can do the same type of thing you could do in numerical differentiation, where you take your definition from calculus, and instead of taking your limit as delta x goes to zero, you just use a finite but small delta x. Okay, so in the next segment, I'll tell you about a more accurate method uh, to do this.